Hi, I'm Jackson Crawford. I'm an Old Norse specialist who can frequently be heard on this channel trying to emphasize the importance of going back to our original medieval sources for Norse mythology, especially the Poetic Edda and the work of Snorri Sturluson called the Prose Edda. But Snorri is sort of a secondary source in and of himself, given that he's relying on and trying to explain many of the poems that made it into the Poetic Edda and some that didn't. And Snorri can contradict Snorri. I want to talk a little bit about that today. Now we have to remember that Snorri Sturluson, writing in, say, the 1220s or so, is not writing for a modern audience, and he has no expectations of the uses that his work will be put to later in time. He's not writing for people who think about, um, you know, these huge bodies of lore that seem to have sort of never-ending questions, but also often relatively never-ending answers, you know, your sort of Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or Star Wars fandoms that often open up expansive worlds, but that have a living or recently living writer who can kind of answer and, and expand on things. He's not expecting that audience, and he's also certainly not expecting an audience of people who are going to be looking to his work to help reconstruct uh, a, a pre-Christian religion, I'll refer to as Alcetru today, from it. He is writing mostly in the prose edda to explain Old Norse poetry. And and I mean the rules of the poetry more than its content, right? The whole reason that he writes Gilvaginning, the part of the prose edda where he discusses so many of the stories in mythology, is to explain the various kinnings and such that you can use if you want to compose traditional Norse poetry, which is his main goal. And there's also his other work, which is often unappreciated in the uh, evaluation of uh, Snorri's contributions to what we know about Norse myth today, and that is the saga of the Inglings, Inglinga saga the first saga in his work called Heimskringla. Now Heimskringla is the story of the kings of Norway told in individual sagas about each one. So we have like the saga of Halfdan the Black, the saga of Harold Fairhair. But the very first one, Saga of the Inglings, is about the mythical ancestors of the Norwegian kings, including the gods. Now Snorri wrote Heimskringla before he wrote the prose Edda, almost certainly. And he's not as concerned about being consistent with the uh, the, the poems, the actual old stories in Ingling Saga as he is in the prose edit. Now he tells some stories in Ingling Saga that he doesn't tell in the prose edit, sometimes that's our only source, but then sometimes he just blatantly contradicts something he says in the prose edit. The best example of that is in the War of the Asir and the Vanir gods and how that is uh, resolved. Now in Heimskringla, specifically Ingling Saga, the Norse gods are purely human. He just calls Odin a hovdingi, a chieftain judge. They're the people of quote-unquote Asia. Snorri was really proud of himself for quote-unquote figuring out that the Asir are the people of Asia, which they're not. The word Asia has nothing to do with the word Asir. But he's trying to, uh, you know, rationalize this in a medieval Christian way, right? He, he doesn't believe that they're gods, but they have to come from somewhere. And in fact... Uh, in England Saga, he even says that, like the Trojans in the Iliad, which he says they are, right, they're specifically from Troy in Asia, uh, they worship the Greek gods. Um, we hear that uh, in their city, called Oscar, or Troy, according to England Saga, Thar var blotstadar mikil, that var thar sidar a tolv hovgadar vor utstir. There was a great place of sacrifice, and it was the custom that twelve temple gods were the highest. Now, he says in Inglinga Saga that the Asir, led by Odin, invaded the land of the Vanir, but both sides tired of that war and agreed to terms of peace, and they exchanged hostages. The Asir received Njordr with his son Froer and Kvasir, while the Vanir received Hunir and Mimir. The Asir told the Vanir that Hunir would make a great chieftain and that Mimir was exceptionally wise. <laughs> 
but Hunir would decide nothing on his own without Mimir present, and the Vanir felt cheated since they had sent a great leader, Njorther, and a great wise man, Kvasir. So they cut off Mimir's head and sent it to Odin. Odin smeared the head with herbs to keep it from rotting and enchanted it so it could speak to him and tell him many hidden things. Remember that the dead are often associated with seeing the future because they're already on the other side of reality from the living um, and the Norse aren't discriminating. As many cultures don't between those who have passed out of our world and those who have not yet come into it in a sense. Now this story is fairly familiar if you've read you know any of the given big books of Norse mythology or Wikipedia articles or whatever about this but it only comes from Ingling Saga one of the least reliable sources for Norse myth that comes from the Icelandic Middle Ages because it's written by Snorri in an attempt to completely euhemerize, that is, make human the stories of the gods as the ancestors of the Norwegian kings and kind of rationalize it according to medieval Christian ideas. Let me give you a quick word from my sponsor and I'll come back and tell you how the very same writer in a different book, the Prose Edda, says a completely different thing about the old war between the Asir and the Vanir and how it was resolved and who these people are. Now, if you've read the Prose Edda, and I will eventually have a translation out from Haggett, um, but I recommend the one by Falks out of the ones that are available. It's the only one I recommend out of the ones that are available. You'll notice that in the prologue, Snorri also goes off in his pretty half-baked story about how the Norse gods are really the Trojans. But he leaves that alone after the prologue, right? The prologue is kind of covering himself and showing, you know, I'm not a pagan, I don't believe in this stuff, and I'm showing off my medieval Christian learning and, and, and integrating this with the Bible and, and classical learning like the Iliad. But he really lets that go afterwards. So we don't have the same, you know, the, the attempt to hold to this pretty weak cover story about Troy. Now, in Skaldskapur Mall, which is the part of uh, the prose edda where Snorri talks about the war between the Asir and the Vanir, although only very briefly, we are told that the gods uh, fought one another and that they... The Aster and the Viner fought one another, and at the end of their conflict, they all spat into a vat. And the spit was such a symbol of their peace that they made a man out of it. That was Kvasir. So Kvasir, this time, isn't a hostage. He's a being created out of the spit of both Aster and Viner gods, and concluding their peace. And that's pretty much the story. It goes straight from there into the Othorir story, because Kvasir's killed and his blood is used to make Othorir the, the meat of poetry. The war between the Aster and the Viners isn't a big deal here. And I suspect that actually our modern, you know, big books of Norse mythology and Wikipedia articles and whatever really overemphasize the importance of this because of Ingling Saga. It's also notable that Mimir is said to be one of the hostages in the Ingling Saga version of the story, but in the Prose Edda, he has no such origin. Notice the hostages don't even come up in the Prose Edda version. Mimir does, but in a completely different place with a completely different origin. We're told about the three roads, or the three roots, excuse me, of Yggdrasil that stretch into the three different realms, and that under the one that goes into or over Jotunheimar, the realm of the Jotuns, not the Vanir, the Jotuns, the gods' enemies, there's a well called the Mimisbrunner, which contains wisdom and is owned by a Mimir, who is very wise because he drinks from it. And if you drink from the well, you become very wise too. And this is why Odin is one-eyed, because he gave up an eye to drink from the well of Mimir. Now, probably I agree with uh, some points derived from the work of Jacqueline Simpson in the 60s. Um, that draws attention to the research on heads in wells as a major feature of pre-Christian Celtic religion, a phenomenon much studied in the mid 20th century by Anne Ross. In numerous folk tales from Britain and Ireland, heads, just separate heads from bodies, dwell in wells. And in the work of Simpson and Ross, you can read a really surprising number of these folk stories uh, from the Celtic or formerly Celtic-speaking world about heads in wells. 
This makes it pretty likely that Mimir's Head and Mimir's Well are part of the same tradition, either closer related to or possibly derived from Celtic tradition, and that Mimir was originally, canonically if you will, a head in his well, and that the, the, the beheading uh, that happens in the Ingling Saga story when um, Odin ends up cutting off, or the, uh, the Vanir end up cutting off Vanir, the Vanir cut off Mimir's head, send it to Odin, and Odin pickles it, uh, is probably invented by Snorri uh, to go along with his, you know, Asian Asir story. And that originally Mimir is just a head in a well. He's probably one of the Jotnar rather than one of the Vanir or Asir. You know, like, all this gets confused because, again, Snorri's not trying to please a modern audience. He's trying to explain old poetry in the prose Edda. He's trying to explain, in again, a medieval Christian rationalized way, the origin of the Norwegian kings in Heimskringla. He does contradict himself, and we need to be ready to evaluate Snorri on his own terms and not just on the terms, you know, that we would like where, you know, we want to, <laughs> I don't know, find some key in something he said to the extended edition, the director's cut of Norse mythology, because we're never going to get that. And if we got it from Snorri, I'm not sure that we could uh, completely trust it without a lot of corroboration from surviving old poems like the Poetic Edda, which thankfully we have for many stories that are in the prose in it. All right. Well, from beautiful Wyoming, let me wish you all the best.